Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Sarah Jones on the Politicus Pod for Politicus USA's The Daily. Please make sure you subscribe to our Substack so you don't miss any episodes. And the full transcript is always on the Substack, which is under um, Politicus USA's The Daily. So today we're going to talk about what's going on with the MAGA MAGA Hydra, what everybody gets wrong about Trump and his supporters. And I don't mean this at all in the way that the New York Times, you know, sends somebody to a diner in rural Ohio to interview the Trump supporter like they are the only and most important voice in the political world but rather because we are faced with this movement that is not dying. And so we need to understand, and I think many of us want to understand, what's going on and why. And also, we want to, you know, bring this country back together. So um, it's come to a point now where, while it's easy to look down on people and, and judge them, Uh, And certainly a lot of reasons to do that, given what they support. Um, There's also the other part of being a citizen, which is, you know, they're not, the mountain is not coming to us. So let's at least try to understand what's going on with them. Maybe then we can um, help inch this movement uh, towards the cliff where they can effect change. Um. So the Hydra I refer to is the sort of noxious, dangerous, Palin Trump populism that has taken root. And no matter how many times Republicans even and the rest of the country cut its head off, uh, more pop up. A Hydra is a many-headed serpent or a monster in Greek mythology that was slain by Hercules and each head of which of Uh, is cut off, is replaced by two others. Or, you know, when it's not capitalized, it's a, um, uh, an evil not to be overcome by a single effort. And I think that's really where we are right now. The, so the Hydra I'm referring to here is this, this Palin Trump populism. And, you know, that's how we got to this uh, Republican primary lineup that was in the morning consult where Trump leads DeSantis now um, an increase in Trump's following uh, an increase in Trump's support following his indictment on criminal fraud charges in New York appears to be leveling out but he's still well ahead of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and just over half of potential Republican primary voters 53% support his candidacy down from a high of 57 last week, but meanwhile, DeSantis's backing has increased marginally from a low of 22% last week to 24 But things are so bad for DeSantis that Republican political strategist Mike Madrid of the Lincoln Project said of um, the latest Wall Street Journal poll was a, quote, red alarm for DeSantis as he has uh, high positives, but a low base, and ultimately there's no path. I do want to celebrate that for a moment because Ron DeSantis is an autocrat, uh, you know, training under Victor Orban. So is Donald Trump. But in some ways, and, and these two are very different, in some ways, um, the ways that DeSantis is more threatening. If he, um, if he could get the support, he would be um, possibly, you know, worse than than Donald Trump. I know that's hard to imagine, um, but I think we have to be really steely eyed about how we see this landscape unfolding in front of us. There aren't good choices. Um, there are a bunch of really bad choices. None of these people, even in the whole lineup, have a platform worthy of supporting. Um, But that's exactly why they are where they are right now. That's why they have come to this, to these power grabs. So 
the you know the thing with DeSantis is he he doesn't have the charisma that Trump has, and so that is really the uh, the thing that's protecting the country from from him taking over. Um, and a new uh, NBC poll found that 68 percent of Republican voters still support Trump after he's been charged with 34 felony counts in Manhattan. Um, yeah, those results really seem to surprise powerful Republican donors and establishment types. They were really hoping to insert DeSantis as sort of a withdrawal pacifier for Trump supporters. But, you know, I've been warning for almost a year that the Trump base is not enthusiastic about Ron DeSantis. They tell me DeSantis seems snobby, he's elitist, and he's just not capturing their attention. The bottom line is that he is not Trump. And Republicans thought that since their base was so primed to respond to, you know, oftentimes manipulated uh, culture wars instead of issues, given that the only issue that they agreed on um, was uh, uh, was abortion, and now now that they have it, they're fighting among themselves um, about just how much control they should be allowed to have over women, uh, and more on that later. But they, they could easily, they thought that, that they could easily, um, their base could easily be fed another culture war hero with a kind of cleaner image and a less drama-filled personal life. And that's you know, Ron DeSantis, he's very much presenting with his, like, picture-perfect, um, kind of white supremacist image, um, you know, family. Republicans thought they could feed DeSantis to the base, um, because they know the issues don't matter. And I think we can all agree on that, and anyone who doesn't agree to that is, is, um, I would urge you to pay more attention, um, and talk to people who, you know, look at, it's always one thing you can always tell people when, if they are confused about what's going on and, and that's fair enough to be confused the way things are covered, but always look at how, uh, people are voting. Just go look at the, the votes. You can Google that and, and those will tell you, uh, a lot about where people actually stand. Now, some of the legislation is written to deceive people about what it actually represents, so then you have to Google that. I mean, this is exactly why um, we started Politicus USA was to to break down through all of that kind of confusing verbiage, just to say this is what this bill stands for, um, and this is how people voted on it. You know, Trump ran a campaign ad praising Dr. Fauci in 2020, and his entire base now hates Dr. Fauci and pretty much any mention of science now unless the science is something that they can weaponize or it comes from a far-right hero. But then, you know, since science doesn't usually come from far-right heroes anymore, because far-right heroes start off as one thing and then end up being led into the sort of absolute worst versions of themselves with a huge helping of seething resentment in their presentation. So there's way too much emotion and reaction uh, at this point in the extremism that Uh, dominates the Republican Party for science to have any kind of uh, leadership role. But still, you know, the base isn't having it. Uh, They're just, they're not buying DeSantis. DeSantis is like this, is mealy-mouthing his way into cosplaying a strongman. And for example, an ad that's being run titled, quote, Never Back Down, um, in which DeSantis takes on, you know, quote, takes on Dr. Fauci and the woke is highlighted. Uh, This is not ostensibly not coming from any DeSantis campaign, um, but from this organization calling itself Never Back Down. See, that's where we are in this world. We we don't know because of all the dark money who's who's involved. Uh, So, you know, campaign finance needs to be uh, updated. It needs to be strengthened and Citizens United needs to be struck down. But in any, uh, we all know where we are with that. Um, 
But in fact, you know, the only big move made for DeSantis, and that's not by, but for, is this Never Back Down account, which is on Twitter, pushing their little narrative uphill. They have very small following. Um, They have a clip of Trump praising DeSantis as a governor and a Fox News clip that suggests the media is in the tank for Trump because they think Democrats have the best shot of beating Trump. You know, wouldn't that be a relief if that were true? Um, A media that didn't want their cash cow Trump reelected would be a real gift to our democracy. But unfortunately, we don't have that media. And that is not why, uh, you know, the media is 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 pushing Trump, if anything, because they never made so much money as they made under Trump and they were never so important as they were under Trump. And, of course, you know, as a journalist myself, the uh, the news journalism reporting is important and it should be valued. But I, I think that it, it really got distorted under Trump because it became, um, he, he exploited the way that uh, the, the sort of journalism has had become this, mm, you know, it, it, it's become this thing where, where, the, where it was seen as objective to frame something as this person said X and the other side said Y and leave it at that. That's, that's journalism. And uh, Republicans have really exploited that. And, you know, if you insert a lie on one end of that, then everything keeps moving toward the lie, right? Because in the center, you know, that... And and it really drives me nuts when people say, no, there's two sides to every story. Yeah, there are two sides. And and oftentimes, one is correct, (laughs) you know, because um, it isn't actually cut down the middle. It's like this happens when in all kinds of issues. But just as an example, uh, in domestic violence, you know, there will be this often this suggestion. And I think this is starting to change now, but for a you know, for forever prior to now, um, you know, the last couple of years that it was covered as, you know, he said, she said, when one person is, is exerting control and using violence and other methods of control to dominate and, and make one person terrified for their life. That's not, um, both people aren't wrong. And, and I think it also gets conflated. And, and I relate the the Republican Party tactics to abuser tactics. I think they're very similar. And if you look at the way that the stories are told, they're very similar. So the way they, they uh, get away with um, some of the really horrific things they do is through the same tactics. It's through, and, and that is all endorsed by and made possible by patriarchy. So, you know, it's, it is kind of all the same thing. It's a story of dominance. It's a story of controlling the narrative. So people would say, oh, you know, he said, she said, and then it's made, um, it's made possible by pointing out, um, a flaw in the victim, say the, um, say the woman who was abused. Well, she, you know, wasn't always a great person. She did X, Y, and Z. Well, Right, but there are no perfect people. That's there is no perfect party. So extrapolate that out, and we talk about the Democrats. Well, the Democrats aren't perfect. I mean, you know, politicians are politicians. You, uh, uh, you can always find, and then Republicans will often point to some legislation that was that was proposed by an extremist in the Democratic Party as equal to the extremists that are running the Republican Party and legislation that they actually passed. Those two things are not the same thing at all. Uh, and again, they're there to get lo- it gets lost in the, we're going to find this one exception to the rule. We're going to point to the, um, you know, the sort of straw man on the other side. Uh, and all of this means that when we talk about politics, we are not talking about the issues that matter. We're not covering politics the way it matters to the people. And that's the other reason we started Politicus USA. So, or or Jason started it and I joined um, the next year. So, 
Uh, back to this thing about <laughs> if we had the media that we should have, then, then, you know, Donald Trump wouldn't even be an issue. He would not be uh, even a contender, right? This is a criminal defendant um, at long last uh, who should have been a criminal defendant throughout his his uh, adult life and and hasn't been because of everything that's wrong with our system, because of how we reward money and we have taught our entire culture to kind of worship rich people as if they have some special um, knowledge. And, you know, we're seeing with the breakdown of Elon Musk on Twitter in public that just how untrue that is. And if, and if anyone wasn't sure watching Donald Trump disintegrate, um, emotionally as president and now as a criminal defendant, you know, I think it should have been obvious. I mean, it should have been obvious before that because there are no uh, superheroes in real life. There just aren't. And um, we all want to believe in that in some level. But the bottom line is that we're we're kind of, you know, you, you look for people who are trying to do good. And if those people aren't perfect, they're, they are deserving of support, certainly, but they're not perfect. Um you know, but back to DeSantis. So the base kind of sees, I see DeSantis as, as the Wizard of Oz. Like he puts on this big show, but when you pull back the curtain, there's, you know, little DeSantis. He, he, he just doesn't have, um, he isn't the person he, he presents himself. And, and here he is, he's getting hammered by Mickey Mouse. So they see Trump mocking DeSantis for losing to a mouse. And they see DeSantis trying to of all things, you know, virtue, virtue signal after all of this, you know, conservatives um, mocking virtue signaling. That's what DeSantis tried to do. That's the only attack he really lobbed against Trump to virtue signal about Trump's affair with the porn star when the shamelessness is the point of this cult. What a stupid move. You know, you don't try to look at me and my perfect family. Um, we're so we're upholding all the values of this party. That's not what's happening, Ron DeSantis. I don't know um, what memo he missed, but that's not what the what the base is responding to. And I speak about the Trump base with confidence that I don't think most of the people in the media have because I, I live in a Trump district. And um, I know that the people that are being interviewed by uh, big media outlets, that, that they lie to the media. They know how they're portrayed. They've told me themselves. I don't want to be portrayed as, as a racist, and I don't want to be portrayed as a, as a bigot. They're very sensitive about that, actually. And, it, and while that isn't reflected in their actions, you might say be surprised to hear that. But they are very sensitive about that. Um, because they don't see it that way. And and so they lie to the media, you know, because they'll tell me things. I hear these things in daily life that I, you know, they are racist. Um, the they, they may not even realize that they're being manipulated through racism and through bigotry because elites have always used those kinds of issues to divide people. And it's how they have kept power throughout history not just U.S. history, throughout um, the history of, of democracy. That tool has been weaponized. Um, you know, we could get in, I, I don't have time today, but religion it itself has often been used as that kind of, of, of tool as well. So, yes, you see how that relates to uh, what the Republican Party is doing. So, or organized religion, I should say, not certainly not faith and not belief and not all religion, I'm not trying to portray that as as itself bad, but organized religion is prone to uh, being abused, to being used as a power, um, a tool to keep in power. So, you know, the base, the this conservative base, they see a loser in, in DeSantis, and, and they want this kind of persecution complex infected delusional self-identified winner with with a lot of charisma um like sarah palin and and donald trump 
um, <laughs> uh, it, it's 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 still. I'm just pausing because it, it's so. I really thought that that this should have died after Sarah Palin, and and then Donald Trump picked up her mantle and made it even worse. So, you know, it, it's odd because neither of these two people seem very remarkable on paper. And even now, you know, who would look at Donald Trump's resume and say, well, he would make a great president. Um, he had a background in what appeared to be either mafia related business activities or just pure scams. And, and he's done, you know, some reality TV. He's sold some stakes. He had his name in gaudy gold letters plastered on buildings and casinos. His time in the White House was an unmitigated disaster, an international humiliation for the United States. I've had some off-the-record conversations about that with people um, in other countries of in the media. And, you know, it's... <laughs> I've... I've I've struggled to explain to them how this this happened, um, and this and it culminated in, in untold additional deaths from COVID nineteen due to his petty mismanagement and and vindictiveness. You know, but when Trump speaks to his supporters, they feel seen. They feel this most selfish man, this most narcissistic president in modern history, is looking out for them. You know, he signals all of his resentment to them the way he's been left out of high society and they think he's one of them because they too feel left out or left behind. Um, and that is all that matters to them. I think it's a visceral, emotional thing. It has nothing to do with issues. The psychology of the Trump supporter is both deeply disturbing in terms of how it odds their perception is with um, is with reality, and yet it's also really familiar because the cultish following um, of a, of a populist is terrifying, and it's unexamined power. This huge swath of people bending to the whims of one person can be, you know, easily led to hate and to act on that hate. And we've seen that throughout history. That is how some of the worst things have happened. Um, that is how, you know, Hitler came to power through democracy. He didn't take that power. He was given that power uh, long after he exposed some of his uh, worst impulses, much like Trump. Um, and, and it's also really hard to get out of cults. I mean, throughout the Trump presidency, there were a lot of cult experts talking about this. How do we get people out? And I think that's part of why I'm I'm digging into this because many of you may have interactions with a Trump supporter in real life. And, you know, I don't think it's really possible to get anyone out of this cult, but it is possible to drop little nuggets of of reality. And one of them... Um, that I have long used. I was very pleased to see uh, AOC use, say the same thing in an interview yesterday. I thought she she puts things so well. She's just so um, such a good communicator, and she pointed out, you know, what has this what has the Republican Party done for you? And that's something I always say to Trump supporters. I don't get into debating. All of his issues, most of them aren't even true. So there's just really no point. And, and once I, I do, I've gone through the whole fact check thing and they will just pivot, kind of lose interest in that one and then come bring the next issue up. And it isn't just Trump supporters who do that. Like, you know, I've had conversations with people in QAnon who are from the left. Same thing. It's just, um, you know, when you're in that space of of not... Uh, of really being dedicated to being a part of this community, and that's what it is for them. Uh, they're a part of something. It's really important to understand that, I think, for us who want to save democracy. Um, and so they're a part of this community, and that's what they're getting out of it. They're getting a lot of rewards for that membership, and that's really powerful. 
And so I will just say things like, oh, you know, they use uh, that trans issue. They use that trans issue um, to kind of get people to vote for them when most of their policies actually don't benefit people like you. Um, I, I try to drop that into conversation and just kind of leave it there as something to uh, maybe a seed that's planted. Um, and it's not that I'm trying to, uh, you know, convert people. I, I don't think that, um, I don't think it's possible. <laughs> I have, I, 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 I've had these conversations for years and it's just, you know, people will come to something on their own, but when you plant that seed, sometimes people will, something will click for them later. And that's kind of the only option we have is to leave some kind of bridge to them. Um, so they, so, in you know, the other thing is to not, don't make it so easy for them to hate everybody. You know, uh, that's another thing I think people can do as, as much as that, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting not to shun people who are actively, um, engaging in hate. That's a totally different thing and they need to be shunned and ostracized. But I'm talking about people that you might have a personal connection with, that there might be some reason they might respect you. Um, and they need to know that all of these people they're being trained to hate are real people and they're not bad people. And I think that it's, it's, a lot harder to sell that to people who know someone in their personal life. Um, It's harder to demonize people that uh, you know in, in real life. So, you know, but I've been documenting this kind of cooling of visible enthusiasm for Trump on the ground in Trump country. And part of that has been the signs that I've seen up, you know, since 2015, I do, um, travel around between uh, rural Pennsylvania, rural Ohio, conservative areas in Ohio, and Michigan um, regularly. And I've been doing that since I started um, probably probably in, 20, in 2012. Before that, I, I lived in the South, of all things. <laughs> um, kind of got my fill there as well of, of the Palin people. So that helps me see what's happening on the ground and talk to real people who don't feel threatened as, as they do when, you know, they don't, they think the media is evil. So, um, I try to just have conversations with them and ask them what they think about things, um, without putting it on the record. So, you know, the, the Trump supporters that I talk to, they're still all in, even though these signs have come down. I mean, some of the most uh, committed people, I, I, <laughs> I saw signs from 2016 that had been spray painted over and just changed to 2020, and they were still up, you know, long after the election. Well, they, they've come down now. Now, not, um, I, I haven't seen one still up. I have some areas left that I'm going to be going to um, in the next couple of weeks, but so I'm hoping to see, you know, whether those signs have, have come down uh, as well. But so far, they've all been down, which has been very strange because we see in these polls that, that these folks have not, um, you know, they still support Trump. So when I talk to them in person, they say they're they're worn down by the drama. Um, and I did notice that January 6th took the edge off of their confidence, sort of the bravado with which they would express their support. It's, it has been cooled. I don't, you know, no matter what anyone says in the Republican party and how they've tried to whitewash that. And the fact that Trump supporters will try to, to say, to excuse January 6th in in any number of ways, including uh, incorrectly blaming, um, the left and the FBI, uh, the truth is that that they do feel some measure of, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of doubt has crept in. Uh, not enough. They're still all in, but there has been some doubt. So, you know, you wonder why can't these other Republicans take on this? It's a big field. Why not all of them have announced, of course, but they're the the 
the probables. Why can't they take on Trump? Why won't they take on Trump? And the truth is that none of them have actually tried. What they are doing is trying to sort of gently tap Trump out of the way from behind while waving way too eagerly to his base. In other words, you know, not a single one of them has had the courage to take on the party leader, even after he became a criminal defendant, and even after he incited an attack on his own country. And this would be laughable if the consequences weren't, you know, so horrific. Um, All of these people running against Trump are afraid of him. And yet they're trying to appeal to his cult by being like him, but with less charisma, less power, less kind of Neptunian fog to disguise the absolute dearth of actual principles. And, you know, we need only listen to these Republicans on the abortion issue, the one issue they are fighting about, to discover the problem. They're all trying to establish themselves as super hardline about abortion, but they keep getting tripped up by that very stance. All it takes is someone asking them, what about rape or incest? Or is Trump right in saying abortion should be a state's issue? And yes, I mean, I'm sure that kind of got the attention of people who've been paying attention to this issue because isn't that their entire argument? Wasn't that that their entire argument? That whole state's issue has caught up with the party of raging control freaks because while they've been saying forever that it should be a state's issue and the Supreme Court just gave them that in a huge win for their decades-long crusade against women's freedom, um, now... That isn't quite enough for the movement. Now they want more. Now they want abortion banned at conception. I would like to pause while we mourn the loss of common sense. Because I'm actually seeing a lot of men causing, uh, uh, pushing this. They want abortion banned at conception. You know... (laughs) The ignorance is, is, is the ignorance and, and coupled with the arrogance to assume that they know more than doctors do and that, and that they have any right over um, health care for a women is, is astonishing. The anti-abortion conservative base wants abortion banned everywhere at conception. But Donald Trump, this man, <laughs> this man, this twice divorced, how many affairs, um... You know, he knows that this issue is not a winner. He blamed abortion instead of himself, conveniently, for the failure of the red wave that wasn't the 2022, the, you know, 2022 midterm red wave that was supposed to be. So a small slice of this anti-abortion crowd is super angry at Trump. And with the policy director for the American Principles Project claiming Donald Trump just committed to no federal role on the issue of abortion. In other words, he's pro-choice now. He left that tweet up, it seemed, for days. Um, Then when I went back to get the link to it, um, because I collect all of this stuff through several weeks when I'm thinking about a topic like this podcast, um, I went back, he he had just deleted it. Uh, so that just shows you, he obviously got some, some, a lot of negative feedback, although his tweet had, um, a lot of people agreeing with him in the comments. And then Republican Senator Lindsey Graham was asked to explain Trump's position on abortion, um, on, on CNN on Sunday, and he didn't seem to really want to articulate anything specific, so... He took refuge in a gish gallop of lies about abortion and thereby making the problem even that much more obvious. Republicans simply don't have an answer on abortion. Uh, Graham, for example, claimed Democrats want abortion on demand up to the moment of birth and, and taxpayer funded. And yeah, abortion should be covered. I completely agree with that, but absolutely nobody wants abortion at the moment of birth. 
And this is an absolutely disgusting accusation that could only come from someone who has no empathy for the horrific pain that parents who have to go through a medically directed termination or have a stillbirth are going through. On the other end of the spectrum in the Republican Party, Republican Representative Nancy Mace is trying to sell the idea that you can be pro-life and pro-woman and that Republicans need to show, quote, compassion, unquote, for rape victims. You know, (laughs) what she's really arguing, like drumroll please, is that there should be an option to get an abortion otherwise known as having a choice. Yeah, I don't know. It's a wonder why some of these people are still in the Republican Party. It's, what are you doing, Nancy? What are you thinking? Because what you're saying is there should be a choice. And that's the problem that they have with the entire premise of their entire argument. If abortion is murder, as they argue, and it is not, but if it were, um, then it would never be okay. And so what they're saying, and now, what they are now you know, saying, many of them, is that it should never be an option. So women who, who have been raped or incest victims uh, or a 10-year-old rape victim should be forced to give birth. That's their position, and they can't find their way out of that. They can't find a way to not sound as abusive and anti-life as that position is. Anti-freedom, right? I mean, this is the party that's called themselves a freedom party. They have a freedom caucus, for gosh sakes, in the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. And they're literally trying to and have successfully taken freedom away from millions of women. This is why the Republican base, um, the Republican Party, keeps their base focused on shooting up Bud Light cans. Because if anyone paused long enough to ask, gee, what does this party do for me, things would get ugly really quickly. The Palin Trump populist movement echoes other populist movements in history, but in its pride for its sort of pugnacious ignorance and lack of actual policies, it brings to mind the... uh, Pujitism movement articulating the grievances of shopkeepers and small businesses that were facing economic and social change um, back in nineteen fifty in the nineteen fifties in France. But this time around, of course, its grievances are about social change, and they're, and they're using those grievances to cover opposition to taxes for big business. So it's not exact parallel, but in the sort of presentation. Um, and, and the ignorance that it, it, the Pugetist movement became known for, um, it, it really mirrors what's going on. Um, so the, this movement was a French movement um, uh, created by um, Pierre uh, Pujade after 1953, mobilizing the lower middle classes, shopkeepers and artisans, and the peasantry in the South and in opposition to um, big business and the unions and the state and the administration, but mainly to taxes. That doesn't sound familiar. I don't know what will. Um, Right wing and populist, but also Republican, uh, the Pujitists exploited widespread discontent with the Fourth Republic, winning over two and a half million votes in the 1956 election and returning 53 deputies, but within two years, lacking leadership and a program, the movement collapsed. Yeah, their movement collapsed because they didn't have leadership or a program. Unfortunately, this movement here just won't die because the Republican Party, aka the party for the elites, continues to stand down to Donald Trump. They will do whatever it takes to grab more power for their rich and powerful puppet masters. And if they have to bow down to the most anti-American president this country has ever had to get it, they will, and they are. And yes, I am calling him anti-American. He, he, 
uh, incited a self coup against his own country. So, he himself identifies as anti、uh, American in his actions, not his words, but、um, so I think it's a fair call. The only way out for the Republican Party would be for them to find someone willing to run in a kamikaze mission to take Trump down. But to do that, they would have to not care at all about winning Trump supporters, but rather focus on destroying Trump's image as a winner. And the key to doing that is really obvious, but not one of the primary possibles has even gone near it. It's all about destroying Trump's manhood. It would be very simple. To do. That is, it would be very simple to do if they cared about the United States. This has been Sarah Jones on the Politicus Pod for Politicus USA's The Daily. And if you're tired of billionaires controlling the news you see, like Elon on Twitter and Mark Zuckerberg, and you want to support independent news, Like Politicus USA, that puts the people first, please do subscribe to our Substack. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking with you all soon.